And we're going to continue with, uh, say, try to take this all the way through the Bible on a biblical perspective on the troubles in the believer's life. And we're going to look at a lot of different characters from the scriptures uh, and the troubles that come into their lives and the reasons why. And there's different reasons for why they come. That. But, uh, let's start with Job chapter 5. I'm going to read some verses here. Job 5, verse 6 and 7, then Philippians 1.29, which I quoted this morning. Job 5, 6 and 7. We heard from last week. There it says, Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upwards. And then in Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Heavenly Father, we pray and ask, Lord, Father, for your blessings now on this evening's service, Lord. Few in number tonight. So, Lord, I pray, speak to our hearts. Lord, let us get out of the message, Lord, what it is that you intended. Lord, a lot of trouble comes. Sometimes trouble comes just because that's what life is. Or sometimes trouble comes because of things we do and we bring trouble on ourselves. Sometimes trouble comes, Lord, because you have a purpose in it, as we talked about in this morning's message. So, Lord, open the scriptures to us and give us wisdom and understanding out of them. And we pray and we ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. Again, like I say, we're going to look at lives of many of the individuals of the Bible and those troubles that came into their lives. We want to look at why the trouble came. We want to look at what was done about it and we want to see what resulted from it. So we're going to start with Noah. So we'll go over to Genesis chapter 6. Very next individual, note in the Bible. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. One man and his family totaled up to eight people against the entire population of humanity. How far are you willing to go? to stay faithful to the Lord. It was Noah against the world. <laughs> you know, then the Lord commands Noah on top of it all. Here he is. He's, <laughs> you know, Noah's, you know, going against the entire world, living for God the way he's supposed to. Only Noah out of all of humanity finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Then God commands Noah to build a huge ark. <laughs> you know, basically a great big giant rectangular box. Okay, it wasn't a ship. Okay, never mind that foolishness down in Kentucky. Okay, it was an ark. It was a box. Read the read the dimensions. You know, read, when it, when all else fails, read the instructions. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't need no instructions. <laughs> He told him to build an ark to save him, to save his family, and two of every creature uh, that God's going to send to Noah to get onto that ark. Because God is going to destroy all life on the earth with a worldwide flood precipitated, you know, like the play on that word, huh? <laughs> precipitated by 40 days and nights of rain. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. By faith, Noah, 
being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. This is the message that Noah is to preach for 100 years while he's building the ark. It's going to rain. Folks, water's going to come down out of the sky and flood the earth and drown y'all. <laughs> and God's saying, look, get right with me. I'm having my servant Noah build this ark to get into to save y'all. And people are going like, wooey, cuckoo. <laughs> This guy's nuts. You've been in the sun too long, Noah. Rain, what in the world are you talking about? Yeah. Never rained before. Never been a cloud in the sky before. They've got no idea. I mean, this is just like, and you're, you know, you were, you know, somebody whacked you too many times in the head there, Noah. And so Noah and his family are eight oddballs out of eight billion people. It's estimated that the population of the earth at the time of Noah is exactly what it is right now. And what's the Bible say? As it was in the days of Noah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, as far as they're concerned, they're just this little group of paranoid, self-righteous, white wing conspiracy theorists <laughs> whose heads are threading on just a little too tight. Uh, you can just imagine the kind of trials, the kind of troubles that Noah and his family experienced in those hundred years. But that's what happens when you put the Lord first and choose to obey Him, irregardless of what it is that He asks you to do. Like maybe coming to church. Yeah. Now you can try to avoid all that trouble by simply just ignore the Lord, right? Ignore the Lord, ignore what he said. Yeah, go ahead, try that one out. <laughs> try out, just see how well that works out for you. Sure, the Lord's just going to say, hey, that's okay. I understand. Who needs the trouble? <laughs> You're going to go to heaven anyway when you die, right? No need to be a fanatic. You just do what you want. That's okay. There's no obligation on you whatsoever. Go ahead, skip prayer. Skip the Bible. Skip church. Skip being a witness. They really aren't necessary. You do you. No worries. Not. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be real serious here. I've been being facetious. Let me be serious. You better listen to me. The Lord's trying to spare you, okay, through my testimony. 25 years out of God's will and living like a lost man. And I'm still paying the price and so is my family. So you go ahead. Oh, it ain't nothing. It doesn't matter. You go ahead. I warned you. Why do you think God put me? as the example to this church. Don't listen to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You do that. Yeah. You've been warned and warned many, many times before tonight. Not just by me. So you go right ahead and you try God and you see it. He won't give you a good spiritual licking. I'll tell you all about it, what it's like okay, when God decides to lower the boom on you. Still pan. Still pan. 
And I'm thankful, thankful that in His great love and compassion and mercy that He did to me what He's done. I don't talk about it a lot, but I walk around in pain every day. I had my body wrecked. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and take on a pickup. Well, I didn't get to take on the pickup truck. I didn't see him coming. Took me out from behind. You're going to lose. Okay. Pain every day of my life. I thank God for every moment of it. He could have killed me. Half a second earlier, I'd have gone into a fire hydrant. Half a second later, I'd have gone straight into a telephone pole when it came off the hood of that truck. As it was, I fell into a dirt berm. That was God's little love tap trying to get my attention, saying, you done messing around now, boy? Worse yet, he could have just left me alone and let me go on in self-destruction and destroy myself and destroy my wife and destroy my kids. Go ahead, sit home. Go ahead. Don't be a witness and testimony for Jesus Christ. You go ahead. Live like the world. Flirt with the world. You see what happens. If you ever get your senses back, <coughs> turn around, the Lord will be there waiting for you. Just like he was for me. Noah and his family go through the flood. They come out the other side. They inherit the earth. King Noah the first. King Noah the first now reigning. Now, same fruit that got Adam got Noah. Uh, over there. Read that. Let's see, where are we at here? Uh, verse 20 of chapter 9. Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine. And was drunken. Well, he wasn't drinking new wine, that's for sure. He got drunk. You can sit down and drink all the grape juice you want. <laughs> It'll clean you out real good. <laughs> you ain't gonna get drunk on it. He was uncovered in his tent. Within his tent, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Go ahead, drink your alcohol. Argue for it. Justify it all you want to. It's going to get you in the end. Or maybe it'll get one of your kids. Because they uh, take after your example. Alcoholism. Cirrhosis of the liver. DUI arrests, job loss, or maybe even a nice little funeral for that loved one who died in the wreck while you were driving drunk. Go ahead. Oh, and by the way, that goes for marijuana too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit on that one. Every opportunity I have, I was warning people years ago about what was gonna happen with that. Yeah. The legalization of recreational drugs is a lie. It's all about the tax revenues, folks. <laughs> okay, alcohol was illegal in this country at one time. Okay, they didn't bring it back. Oh, that was the excuse. Of you. Well, it'll cut down on the crime. You know, they got all the gangsters and everything stuff at this time. Well, no, no, no. They said, we'll tax it. Let them, let them have, well, of course, all the politicians were drinking their booze anyways. Let's tax it. It's like they tax tobacco. Yeah, it's another one I got no use for. My mother ended up in an early grave because of tobacco. 
It's all about that. Noah gets drunk. And his youngest son, Ham, does something to his father while he's passed out. Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Well, he's laying there in a tent, passed out, naked. I shouldn't have to spell it out. I'm not going to. Now, he'd already blessed all three of Noah's sons. Go back to verses 8 through 17. I won't read them. But there, he blesses Noah, and he blesses all three of his boys. He gives them the earth. Interesting thing about that, though. Back yet, let's read it. Why not? God spake unto Noah and to his son, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark, to every beast of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a token or be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Interesting, here in the month of June, now the sign of the covenant of the rainbow, considering the vile sin that Ham commits against God and against his father, because all sins against God, and how the Sodomites have usurped that sign of that covenant for themselves. So because of the blessing that God had passed on Ham. Noah couldn't curse his son Ham, so he curses Ham's son Canaan. Verse 24, and Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, well, there we go. Another human king vanquished by the devil. Devil's two, humanity's zero. Yeah. Should have paid attention to what happened to Adam. Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Next candidate for king, Abraham. We're going to get started with Abraham tonight. We aren't going to be able to even begin to finish uh, with him. Of course, next Sunday we'll be in our special meetings and we'll come back to him. But, you know, Abraham is one of the most interesting characters in all the Bible. He's called the friend of God over in James chapter 2 and verse 23. Man, <laughs> the friend of God. And so, like Adam before the fall, and like Moses, if you go over and read Exodus 33, 11, the Lord spoke to Abraham face to face. Incredible. 
He's listed over in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the great heroes of the faith. But he most certainly sees a tremendous number of troubles, and trials, and heartaches, and difficulties in his life, and for several different reasons do these things occur. Now the Lord commands him to leave his country and the nation of the people to whom he belongs. And his country is over in Ur of the Chaldees. I know this, I need to make one of these things that's like four times the size it is here, but here's the Middle East over here, Persian Gulf, there's Ur of the Chaldees, just to the east of the Euphrates River. That's home. And he is a Shemite. He's a descendant of Shem. But he tells him to leave his country. He tells him to leave his kindred. Okay, the people to whom he's related and descended from. He tells him to leave his father's house, his immediate family, and his relatives, and to go into a land that I will show thee. Go over to Hebrews 11.8. Hebrews 11.8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went, God says, just get out. Okay. Where am I going? Don't worry, I'll show you. I'll let you know when you get there. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when you're a little kid, back of the car, are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you when we get there. <laughs> uh, Abraham has absolutely no idea where he's going. God says go, so he went. He just goes because God has commanded him to do so. That's all it took. He said, okay, I'm going. Any particular direction you want me to go at the moment? He said, just follow the river north, I'll let you know. That's what he does. They follow the Euphrates River all the way up into an area that's known as Padan Aram, up here. to a place called Haran. Now, Haran was his elder brother. He died back in Ur of the Chaldees. And he has his nephew Lot there that he and his father have been taken care of. He doesn't bargain with God. You know. He doesn't set any conditions. Says what you know? It's a, well, I'll serve you if you know. He goes by obedience, strictly by faith. But then he makes his first mistake. He takes along his father Terah, and he takes along his nephew Lot. Well, God told him, leave him behind. Leave all that behind. If we go back to chapter 11 in Genesis, verse 31 and 32, last verses in that chapter. And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran. You know, Daddy takes over. Here. You know, Abraham's telling God, well, God told me to, to leave. Terah, well, no, I'm, we're going with you. But God said, to, yeah, he takes took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. Well, why did they just go? They followed the Euphrates River all the way up. And they came into Haran. Haran, that names it after his dead boy and dwelt there. Now guess what happens? They never leave there. Until, verse 32, in the days of Terah, were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. God 
said, okay, daddy's getting in the way here. So it's just time for him to go home. So he takes Terah home, and so Abraham continues on the journey that God intended for him. And he heads south into Canaan. Say, Abraham is located there. If you look at the apex of that triangular shape there, just north of what today is Syria. Again, the area is known as Padan Aram. Uh, it's on the, uh, Aram is, it, the city's still there. It's on the, the, the Balaka River, which flows into the Euphrates. And Terah doesn't get to see the promised land because it wasn't for him. It was for his boy Abraham. But Abraham still keeps his nephew Lot with him. And that's going to result in some trouble down the road, absolutely, for everybody involved. Okay, back into chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of, the, of Canaan they came. <laughs> Abraham is now in the land and that the Lord wants him to be in which he has promised to give to him as an inheritance. Verses 6 down through 9. And Abram passed through the land under the place of Shechem, under the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south. The land grant that God gives to Abraham is what you see outlined there. You got the Mediterranean over here, that's its western border, down to the Nile. The Euphrates River is its eastern border, down to the Persian Gulf. And then you got a line that runs straight across here from the Persian Gulf, where the heads of the rivers in Eden would have been here before the flood, right on over through the land of Goshen to the Nile River. What belongs to Israel is not just this little strip of land here on the west bank of the Jordan River. That's what they own. There's Turkey up here, Syria, you know, Lebanon, Jordan, you know, Egypt. Yeah, we won't get into modern politics. Mistake number two occurs. When he leaves the land the Lord sent him to and heads to Egypt in hard times. Verses 12, 10. It says, and there was a famine in the land. It's the first famine that gets mentioned in the Bible. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land. But God didn't tell him to do that. Egypt is a type of the world in the Bible, all the way through, one unto the other. We're going to be talking a lot about it in our upcoming special meetings this coming week. About Egypt and Canaan, spiritually. Abraham, Sarah, and Lot are in a strange land where they don't belong. They got no business being there. Instead of trusting God and staying put where he's supposed to be, he decides on his own that the best move 
financially and economically, due to the current downturn, is to seek better opportunities in a steadier and more diverse economic market. It would have been much better if he had trusted in the Lord and stayed back on the ranch. <laughs>